Right, so there is a group of doctors on Instagram where they play doctor. You know, you have those kitchen sets and uh, doctor sets. <laughs> what is homeopathy? I think it's the biggest mistake humankind has ever made. You're taking on a lot of big guns, right? Homeopathy is going to survive as long as human stupidity survives and human stupidity is infinite. Uh, out of, outside of all of this, I have a lot of questions to ask you, but we will start with Dr. Abby Phillips, aka The Liver Doc. Uh, so, first things first, you have a pinned tweet on Twitter, which is 20 points that you've written, yeah. which are very relatable to a lot of people. And uh, some of them seem generic. I have seen a lot of comments coming on that post. So I just want to take them one by one so that okay. they keep aside. Okay. And also there is a reason that you've pinned it. <laughs> that's why I thought let's start from there. Okay. Anyone goes to your profile, that's the first tweet that we see. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It says, one whole egg with yolk a day does not increase blood cholesterol. Yeah. So do we or do we not throw out egg yolks or is it okay to eat it? Um, so it's, it's perfectly fine to have a whole egg a day. That old thinking of eggs increasing cholesterol should just go away. And everyone can actually have one one egg, whole egg with yolk a day. And that does not increase your uh, risk for stroke. That does not increase the risk for any heart disease. That does not increase your risk for high blood pressure. Nothing. It's and that's for safe. someone who does not have a cholesterol problem. If no, you, you even if you have a cholesterol problem, you can okay. have a whole egg a day. Okay. Because no, uh, I mean, none of the heart associations actually tell you to stop eating whole eggs a day. At least one a day is fine. I'm just talking about an average person who is an office going person who has just moderate physical activity. They can easily have one whole egg a day. It doesn't increase cholesterol. We'll go to the next one. Green tea for weight loss, yes or no, doc? Green tea for weight loss, yes. Like, like on, I think someone, somebody has actually con confirmed that okay. in one of the, in the comments section okay. where he said that green tea helps in weight loss if you go and pluck it from the hills and come down and make it yourself and do this every day. <laughs> right, that's the only way green tea can help you lose weight. Okay. Otherwise, there is But this, what's the myth around this? Uh, so, there is this uh, uh, myth that if you have green tea, which is actually slightly immature, mm. I mean, raw kind of uh, tea, that is not the black tea that we have, it has these antioxidants that will help burn fat. Mm. So, that's the wrong, wrong notion. So, it has a lot of antioxidant potential, not just tea. I mean, a lot of beverages and spices have antioxidant potential. But this, the whole aspect of fat burning from antioxidants and all is, is a wrong notion that people get. And green tea has been promoted and advertised Correct. for that specifically without actual scientific uh, evidence backing it. So when you have extraordinary claims, you need to have extraordinary evidence, which is lacking in green tea. So there is no study that says that green tea actually make, helps you lose weight. Got it. Again, again, a very, very popular topic. Jaggery, better alternative to white sugar. <laughs> so the, the whole aspect is that, uh, uh, I mean, white sugar is definitely not good. I'm not, I mean, no way saying that, you know, people should have white sugar instead of jaggery. But the whole point is that white sugar, jaggery, honey, they're all sugars. Correct. Right, they're all sugars. They have equal or even more amounts of calories if you take equal quantities of those. And, and they're all, uh, they all increase your calorie consumption and the calorie, uh, uh, you know, content in the, in the food. So it's not like if you switch white sugar with honey or jaggery, you are actually having lesser sugars. No, you are having the same amount of calories, which, which is what matters, energy consumption. And because honey is very uh, sweet, people tend to have little bit of it. So they don't overtly use it. That is how your calorie content from honey reduces, not just because honey is low calorie. People think that because jaggery has more iron in it, a little bit of, little bit more of vitamins in it and some more minerals in it than white sugar. Because white sugar has nothing of it. It has no nutritive value except for the calories. So people think that, you know, jaggery is a much better solution. But for you to, for somebody to have that, uh, the beneficial level of these vitamins and iron from jaggery, you need to eat a lot of jaggery, mm. which actually beats the purpose because then you're having more calories more. than you're having from sugar. How much alcohol is good alcohol? I mean, there's, there's no safe level of alcohol. I mean, this is... A fact. Because alcohol is a well-known poison. We know it as something that is bad for the liver. Yeah. But it's a systemic poison. You know, it can affect your hair to nail, the whole, whole body. And one of the most imp important aspects of alcohol that people tend to willfully ignore is that it is a carcinogen, which mm. means it can cause cancers. It can damage DNA. The moment you drink alcohol, your body is not utilizing any of it for its benefit. It's trying to throw it out. It's not a food because food has nutritive value and your body has some use for it. Alcohol has, has nothing such. 
if uh, alcohol is evil which alcohol is the lesser evil <laughs> uh, i would say there is something known as a non alcoholic ginger ale or a non alcoholic beer i think that's the <laughs> that's the best of the alcohols is there no evidence or study that says shilaji does not work for male sexual health or is that is shilaji the placebo effect Shilajit is given for basically testosterone. You know, it improves your testosterone. It improves your tolerance and things like that. No clinical society mentions that in testosterone deficiency states, you give Shilajit. The only people who talks about Shilajit and testosterone are the ones, are the doctors on Instagram, right? So there is a group of doctors on Instagram mm. where they play doctor. It's like you know, you have those kitchen sets and uh, doctor <laughs> sets where children play. and they want to become doctors so these guys are stuck in that mm. that that mm. mindset they want to play doctors and they play doctors on instagram instagram is the best place to do that so they just bring up these very pre clinical basic studies so there are studies i'm not i'm not denying that there are complete lack of studies there are studies and some of these studies are done in the in vitro in vitro means it's done in an artificial environment or it's done in tissues and cells mm. and mm. it's done in some healthy people very small groups and they have given shilajit versus no shilajit and found out that you know the testosterone levels go slightly high just based on that they have made this whole narrative that you know testosterone deficiency is improved with the shilajit your maleness improves you mm. become the alpha male mm. you know I, i i think the whole uh, you know you want to become like the animal <laughs> uh, you know which that that's what that's what shilajit is uh, been promoted for by a lot of these yeah. gym goers and all that it doesn't work at all mm. so whatever you think is working with shilajit is because of your psychological sense that you know you have paid for the shilajit so something should work quickly haldi wala dude that's your next <laughs> So I did a series of turmeric related posts in the last couple of weeks and I don't know what triggers people when it comes to turmeric because I get the maximum abuses on under my post when it's a turmeric related post. So no, I just a very household thing it's a very <laughs> dadi ka nuskha kind of thing that anything happens so that... this particular topic is I think very close to a lot of people on Twitter and I think uh, people need to understand that uh, when you take turmeric in diet like we take in curries or you take in the dood or you you take little bit of turmeric in warm water or hot water in the morning on empty stomach that is not going to affect you in any way because you are taking very little amount of turmeric and turmeric has a special property that it does not get absorbed in the body at all in its naive form so about 98% of turmeric is passed out in the stools whether you want it or not it's gone and the, the little bit that is absorbed has a very short half life half life means uh, you know about half the amount of substance that remains in your body and the rest of it uh, goes out excreted by by urine or through your stools so the half life is also very short for turmeric so everything that is absorbed the little bit that is absorbed it goes out of the body very fast so nothing stays for it to have any benefits for health clinically speaking so that is why they mix turmeric with uh, pepper and you know you have nano formulations of turmeric and things like that to increase absorption So the whole aspect of haldi dood is just that it you you're flavoring your dood and you're 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 giving your milk a yellow color and nothing more than that. The goodness that you receive from haldi dood is because of the milk. It's not because of the turmeric. Black coffee is your next. Black coffee is one of the most well studied uh, dietary uh, agent uh, on human health. And it have shown that you know black coffee at least 3 cups a day without sugar without milk uh improves your liver function parameters that is it reduces liver inflammation in those who have non alcoholic fatty liver it reduces progression of non alcoholic fatty liver to chronic liver disease and in those who have chronic liver disease or cirrhosis it reduces the risk of developing liver cancer so this is well known and this are this is these are not like you know 100 and uh, 200 patient study these are studies in lakhs of patients so there is some value there and obviously that 3 cups a day to 5 cups a day it's safe it does not contrary to what people think that it causes stomach ulcers it raises your blood pressure it causes uh, reflux disease it doesn't do any of that so all of that may have some other reasons behind it but coffee has been shown not to cause any of these so it's safe to consume what is apple cider vinegar um the apple cider vinegar is actually a good salad dressing <laughs> that's all i know about it because there is no, no science behind it it's a good salad dressing and when i put up uh, this tweet i found out that a lot of european uh, i mean uh, friends and followers from europe they actually mentioned that no it's not absolutely useless it's good to trap uh, fruit flies so i said okay salad dressing and fruit flies but other than that real scientific studies absolutely none
Call your doctor. Eight glasses of water. How much water <laughs> should one drink in a day? I mean, this is purely to do with human physiology. And but there is something known as a thirst reflex, and it's been put in place evolutionary for you to drink water. Which means that if I'm hungry, if I'm thirsty, my body will tell. Exactly. Drink water either when you feel like it, when you're thirsty, or depending on your activity. Whey protein is it as bad as it made to sound? Uh, a lot of things. If you just Google whey protein, you you'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, misinformation comes from the fact that people correlate whey protein to always people who bodybuild. Yeah. You know, they walk out in the gym and they bodybuild. And when you say bodybuilding, it's anabolic steroids, it's chemical injections and things like that. So I think whey protein was entangled in that misinformation, right? Whey protein is a natural protein. It's your milk protein, and milk has two major proteins. One is whey protein, and one is casein. So casein is a slowly digesting protein. Whey protein is a very fast digestible whole protein which contains all the essential amino acids. But what happens is that a lot of these whey products are uh, sometimes um, adulterated or you know made by poor quality whey protein you get. And most of them are blended proteins. They are add herbals and stuff. Those are the ones that have caused liver damage and kidney damage and all that. Not pure whey protein. Whey protein is very safe. Got it. Reverse aging is possible by popping a few pills. Only instance where I have seen somebody reverse age is uh, Benjamin Button. <laughs> so the whole aspect of uh, uh, reversing aging comes from something known as a French paradox. Okay. So the French people, they consume a lot of saturated fats and unhealthy fats and proteins and all. But they also drink a lot of wine. So they have good survival rates compared to their other European counterparts. So somebody decided that, you know, the French is surviving better because they're drinking wine. Because everybody else is having saturated fats. So everyone should drink wine. Yeah, so <laughs> the, whatever, what, yeah, when wine is good for me, that was the thing at that time. So in the wine, they found out something known as this resveratrol. So resveratrol is this particular uh, compound, active compound, which is considered to reduce cellular uh, oxidation, reduce cellular stress, uh, improve your uh, stem cell regeneration and things like that, all in theory. And some of them have been shown in cell lines and in tissue studies by a lot of these basic scientists, including David Sinclair. So he does a lot of work on it. Uh, work is fantastic. I mean, they have found a lot of pathways of aging and all because of, the, of these works. And I think we'll have some, uh, some kind of understanding of this much, much, many, many decades later, but not now. But right now, extrapolating that to something saying that you, know, you can reverse your aging is absolute nonsense. These are all anecdotal and you know, it's just personal level uh, observations that we cannot recommend uh, in general. But these guys do it because the, the supplement industry is good business. And I, I think if you, somebody wants to, you know, sure shot make profits from the word go, supplement industry is where you should uh, focus on. Fantastic business proposal. I've read a couple of books uh, written by them. Uh, they also have about five to seven pages in the end is citation of researches, right? So yeah. that's why I asked the question that how does one understand? Yeah, so all those researchers are their own work or mostly other people's work in, in, in vitro, in the, in the cell line, in the tissue. It, it doesn't mean that, you know, that is going to happen to a human being if they do it. I mean, for example, imagine somebody is going to drink wine because it has got resveratrol in it. It has got alcohol also in it. Yeah. Alcohol is something that we, have, we already know that reduces your life, right? So how can it work? Just because you want to drink, so that is why we have these resveratrol extracts. All, that particular thing is in many dietary supplements. And uh, none of the studies have proven that human lifespan improves with consumption of resveratrol ex extracts. It might be shown that some of the aging biomarkers in the blood or cells may have decreased in animal studies or cellular studies. But it has not happened yet in a whole human being. So I think we are all aging and I think we don't, I don't think, why, I, I'm not sure why people consider aging as a disease. Mm. It's a normal physiological process. I mean, gracefully age. I mean, that, that's all I, I, I have to say. I mean, I don't think any of these anti-aging or uh, these, these supplements work to reverse aging. But there are a lot of studies being done on aspects of aging, which is interesting. Uh, next week, yoga and weight loss. It does not cause weight loss. Yoga. What the real yoga is, from what I have read from the scriptures. So you have the Hatha Yoga Pediga, you have the Patanjali Sutras, I have read all of it. Unfortunately, I had to read all of it. I have read Haumipati, I have read Ayurvedic texts, I, I have read the whole package. I have spent almost a year reading and finishing all of these textbooks. And the yoga that we practice now is absolutely nothing what has been written in the scriptures. 
So it's when, totally different. What you're trying to say in the tweet is the original yoga form of the the, the the classical yoga hmm. does not lead to weight loss because it is an anaerobic form of exercise. Hmm. So we need aerobic forms of exercise for us to burn fat and burn calories and lose weight. So the real yoga, classical yoga, does not do that. But uh, I mean, you, you I mean, uh, you heard about burpees, right? Yeah, the, yeah, the aerobic yeah, exercise. Yeah. So if you do that in slow motion, hmm. it becomes Surya Namaskara. <laughs> yeah, yeah, almost, almost, <laughs> right. <laughs> You have also that, uh, along with breathing. Exactly. So you have that breathing component and mindfulness into it. In a, in a burpee, in a slow burpee, it becomes a Surya Namaskara. So what people have done is that they do Surya Namaskara very fast and say that they have lose, lost weight. That is not classical yoga. So that you are doing burpees basically with mindfulness. That's it. Yoga is excellent for improving your stability, balance and flexibility, which actually will help you grade uh, yourself to doing better grades of uh, aerobic exercise later on. So I'm not saying that yoga is absolutely bad. If somebody is not doing anything, please do yoga. But if somebody is doing only yoga for core strengthening or, or, or uh, resistance training and all that, no, it is not enough. You need to actually add a uh, proper exercise component to it. So multivitamins. Uh, yeah. I know people who've been taking it for 20 years and they think that uh, but there are things that Right? Multivitamins. I'm talking about the B-complex yeah, multivitamin yeah, yeah, tablets. Yeah, yeah. You can look at it two ways. One is that you are just making expensive urine. <laughs> because your body has a limit to absorb things. I mean, for example, if I am taking a vitamin B12, your body has a limit to absorbing the vitamin B12 that it requires to function. The rest of it, it throws out. So if you are already having a proper meal, proper diet, according to your activity and lifestyle, and then you are consuming multivitamins on top of it, thinking that it is going to improve your health, you are completely wrong. Because excess of multivitamins, your body is going to throw it out. That is why we have a detoxifying system, naturally, your kidneys and your liver. So anything in excess is out of the body. Which is why healthy, apparently healthy people, when they consume multivitamins to improve their health, it doesn't make any sense. We have studies where people, we, People have been followed up, large numbers of people, I'm talking about in lakhs, have been followed up for about 10 years consuming multivitamins and they have found out that they are developing cancers because of it. So there are specific vitamins or vitamin fractions or vitamin combinations that can increase the risk of cancers in you. So that also includes uh, lung cancer because some of these multivitamins contain something known as beta carotene. Yeah, yeah. So if you take prolonged uh, beta carotene and if you are already a smoker or an ex-smoker or you have some occupation that predisposes you to increase of lung cancer risk, Consuming uh, multivitamin with beta carotene increases your risk of getting a lung cancer. Same with breast cancers, same with prostate cancers um, and different types of cancers. Which is why no nutritional clinical society recommends multivitamins in anyone. I mean, when does someone have a deficiency of multivitamins? I'm still, I'm not able to, like somebody has vitamin D deficiency, E deficiency, B deficiency. It does not happen in real life. It does happen in people who are critically ill. And who are, who are not able to take any diet, who might be on parental nutrition. We give them IV nutrition or uh, they have undergone major surgeries of the stomach or small intestine or the large intestine where specific vitamins are not getting absorbed. You give them these combinations of multivitamins where you think these are going to be deficient. For example, post bariatric surgery, if you have, when your small intestine is gone, they uh, give um, um, vitamin B complex for those patients. Or somebody is actually deficient. Somebody has vitamin B12 deficiency and you have clinical problems with it, you supplement that. So that is specific vitamins for specific conditions. Multivitamin in a healthy per person, just like that to increase health. I think it's the biggest myth ever. Last one in this whole series is biotin for hair yeah. loss. So the American Dermatological Association. So I'm a hepatologist. But let me quote the actual authority. So you have... Uh, you have, when it comes to logical fallacies, when you argue, you have appeal to authority and appeal to false authority. So if, if I, as a hepatologist, just say that, you know, biotin is not good for you, that is an appeal to false authority, because I am not a dermatologist. So let me cite the American Dermatological Association. The president of the American Dermatological Association has actually written in their website blog, which is actually a, a guideline blog that they have made for the dermatology practitioners, specifying that there is no use of biotin. Biotin does not increase hair growth, does not increase the volume of hair, it does not prevent hair loss. And this is very well known because none of the studies that they have done looking at these parameters have shown that biotin actually improves any of these hair parameters. 
and it's it's there since decades in their website and people are still prescribing so it it's, and it's very it. similar to multivitamins in the sense exactly. it's been sold for something that doesn't work yeah yeah it's it's just been promoted i mean it's nothing based on actual scientific evidence self medication something very very uh, prominent in in a lot of households i see is it okay to pop an a, a paracetamol if i have a headache or if i get a fever i don't go to a doctor and i just say okay i'll have two paracetamols a day or if i cough or sneeze a bit then i take a citrazine in the night and sleep that's a very common household thing which is happening in india so i think this again comes back to you know the accessibility and approachability with regards to medical care so you have a cough and cold i don't think everybody who has a cough and cold want to go to a doctor hmm. because you have to stand in a queue hmm. you have to pay the consultation fee doctors are busy they'll maybe spend one minute with you and they'll prescribe the drugs you already know that they will prescribe right so they don't want to do that so everybody does not go and get a prescription done that way so and that's logical it's rational because nobody it will be too much for the for the medical community to uh, you know handle that kind of a burden so what they do they know few things which are useful and they'll do self medication with it so there there is a very uh, thin margin between how much you can self medicate for example you have a headache a paracetamol is fine you have a continued headache for 2 days take two or three paracetamol is fine but you have a headache more than 3 days and you're having visual problems then something is wrong you need to go to a hospital but it's a normal headache or a headache because of dehydration bit of water little bit of paracetamol till take care of it that, that that kind of self medication is okay cold sneezing a bit of a, a, a short course of cetirizine is fine nothing is going to happen you I mean you can have like 3 or days 3 or 4 days of cetirizine it, it's perfectly fine now the problem comes when you are going to use medications that are prescription drugs hmm. so in india there is actually no major rule on prescription drugs versus non prescription drugs that is otc over the counter here antibiotics are also otc correct uh, you can actually go and buy sleeping pills also otc people will give you and especially if you have doctors in the family not even immediate family third or fourth cousin doctor they'll give you some prescription you can go and buy whatever you feel like so when it comes to prescription drugs i think people should be more aware for and number one is antibiotics india is no is now go, becoming one of the biggest dens of uh, antibiotic resistance in the world and we are not the ones suffering the real patients who require antibiotics are suffering for example in my case i treat cirrhosis patients advanced liver failure the biggest problem that i see in them is repeated infections and can come anywhere they can have pneumonias they can have something known as bacteremia which is direct infection into the blood very dangerous you just lose patients within hours when that happens urine infection anywhere they can get infected now they get repeated infections and you have to give them different antibiotics at each time because you you it depends on what the culture grows and what the sensitivity is now imagine somebody who does not require any antibiotic in the first place are directly gulping antibiotics for a viral fever somewhere sitting in india and this is happening across the country now with that popping an irrational popping of antibiotics you are creating multi drug re- resistance within you the d- drug resistance is happening now there is something known as community drug resistance so every person is linked to the other person in the community so you have this antimicrobial resistance being transferred and it happens it is true it is it is realistic it can transfer genetically from from an infection to another infection to another person and it can also happen with person to person contact in the within the community that happens through the microbiome so this 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 thing is real and is happening and what is happening is that when real patients like my patients who require antibiotics for example for their severe infection we see that when we test it everything is coming as resistant but then, that's not just because of uh, self medication right it's because of irrational antibiotic use hmm. it it is part of self medication and it is also because of prescriptions prescriptions from doctors who give antibiotics to everybody who comes with a cough and cold hmm. because antibiotics is the term itself is that antibiotic is basically antibacterial so you have a documented bacterial infection you take antibiotics if you have a viral cough and a viral fever why do you need antibiotics in the can we place? say that antibiotics is a straight no for self medication absolutely antibiotics should not be consumed by somebody sitting at home and stocking it stockpiling it antibiotics are not for stockpiling it's it's a prescription drug and the i mean people will realize this once the antimicrobial resistance really hits us you will see so many deaths among cancer patients liver patients kidney patients and lung patients you will see so many deaths 
because you could not give them the right antibiotic because everything is resistant. Is there anything else that uh, we are taking and which we should not in in our daily self medication kind of thing? I'm not going to alternate medicine. Yeah, no, that, that is a given part. Hmm. But other than that, I think painkillers. Hmm. I mean, a lot of people consume painkillers without knowing what they can actually do. There are there are safe set of painkillers that we can give for short period, but there are these painkillers which are mostly old world which can actually harm you. There are specific conditions that require certain groups of painkillers being avoided. For example, take a case of pregnancy. You don't give uh, a pregnant woman a painkiller which belongs to the group known as NSAID, which is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Steroids are safe in pregnancy. Paracetamol is safe in pregnancy. Look at cirrhosis patients. Cirrhosis patients, they have advanced cirrhosis. They are not supposed to take uh, NSAID group of drugs, but they, are, they can take paracetamol. But the, the general thinking is that paracetamol is very dangerous for cirrhosis. It is actually wrong. It is one of the safest analgesic, which is painkiller, and antipyretic, which is anti-fever medicine for even advanced liver disease patients. So there are these specific groups who require specific set of medicines. And in general, people must understand that if they have a pain and they don't have a reason for that pain. For example, pain is a symptom. There has to be a cause for that pain. So you have to treat the cause. Just by treating the symptom may not relieve your pain. So that is why beyond a certain period for example i would say maybe one or two days if a pain is worsening your increase your pain is increasing and it's a disabling kind of pain you actually need prescription and evaluation and then prescription from a proper doctor you don't sit at home and keep popping painkillers because that is going to harm you at some point got it so this was your tweet what exactly are you trying to do on twitter uh, you are a hepatologist so you can talk about a lot of things related to liver, but you're talking about other things, you're calling out other people, you're calling out other pseudosciences and everything. Ultimately, what are you trying to do on Twitter? So this, um, the whole Twitter thing was accidental for me, if you ask me. Because um, the whole, I mean, my work, uh, specifically clinical work and clinical research work, started in 2016, 2017. And uh, I think for a couple of years, from 2016 end to 2019, I was uh, very much into what every other doctor is into. Clinical work, publish. Clinical work, publish. I mean, actually, every doctor is not into publication. They are just into clinical work. But I, I love clinical research, so I, I publish a lot on uh, topics that interest me. And one of the topics was alternative medicine and the liver. So complementary alternative medicine and the liver is something that even I was very uh, surprised about when I actually started seeing that in real life in my patients. So we made a lot of publications on how complementary alternative medicine and their practices affect liver health uh, uh, in, in people in general and also in this group of people already who have pre-existing liver disease. And our, our findings were really very morbid in a lot of deaths, liver transplants and a lot of things like that. So we spoke about it in a lot of conferences, meeting. The American Association of Study of Liver Diseases invited me to present my study uh, at their annual conference and it actually won the best abstract award there because it's something very new. And uh, I came back home, we started practicing and I started seeing more and more patients in the sense that now I'm, I'm diagnosing a lot of these cases with regards to alternative medicine and the liver. And uh, I said that, you know, just by sitting inside your academic circle, and doing what you're doing routinely does not change anything. So you have to break out of it. Which is why I started uh, seeing that, you know, social media, especially Twitter, I was, I mean, I was very active on Twitter at the time, uh, behind shadows and looking at people. Consuming. Yeah, uh, and, and also, yeah, consuming content and also people teaching about, there's a lot of medical teaching happening on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started uh, using Twitter for that purpose, that the public needs to know, the patient community needs to know, and it's not just something that should remain in the academic circles only about these things that matter, with, with, which can affect the public health. Which is why the whole point of Twitter is to let people know what is happening in the field of medicine, especially with regards to hepatology, and especially with regards to uh, unscientific practices or practices which they thought were scientific, which actually harm. So this is all about improving health-seeking behavior among people. I'm not getting anything out of it. In fact, I'm actually losing a lot. I'm losing a lot of money. I'm losing my, my mental peace. I'm losing my sleep. So I'm losing a lot of it. But ultimately, this is just done so that people understand what exactly they need to know regarding health-seeking behavior. So if somebody is well-informed, so for example, like you said, um, somebody needs to lose weight. 
and they go and see that apple cider vinegar is something that is been promoted everywhere and they start doing that and he's actually not losing weight so because of the obesity he develops a heart attack or gets a stroke who's responsible for that the doctors community because the doctors community have not told people that you know this particular practice is useless and for you to lose weight you have to control your metabolic disease be more physically active go for a particular kind of a low calorie diet and all that is those are things that matter i am doing exactly that that is why i use twitter and my whole aim for uh, i mean using twitter is to make sure that people understand what is right and wrong and they can choose what is right for them out of that in uh, instead of just you know putting up so much of information that is confusing to everybody i don't sit on the fence so it's a double edged sword when you say doctor community should it's good that you are doing this on twitter but there are other doctors also doing it on different platforms and you are calling them out as well they are also doctors and there are people who are following them yeah uh you have uh, recently uh, posted something about dr pal there are others that i keep seeing on your timeline so when other doctors are doing it you are still calling them out so i i mean so this is where we need to have consistency so somebody and domain expertise so for example uh, that particular uh, topic about microbiota that dr pal manikams that video went viral uh, on cesarean section versus vaginal labor. so i am a microbiota researcher If you look at my publications, my second most common, my, actually my most common publication is not on alternative medicine. It is on microbiome. So I have a lot of published works, peer-reviewed scientific papers on microbiome, especially in alcoholic liver diseases and other liver diseases, and how we treat them with stool transplants and all that. So we, we'll talk about that. So I I have domain expertise in that, and I I uh, I do a lot of reading and I do a lot of I do a lot of design. I study uh, design a lot of studies on microbiota research, and I know I'm up to date with that. So when I saw something that another gastroenterologist is actually misleading people with, which has been debunked so many years before, it is my uh, duty to correct that. So that is why I call out specifics where I have domain expertise and people need to know the truth. So there is no problem in going for a cesarean section if your doctor orders it, or somebody wants to do a cesarean section for other 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 reasons. It does not mean that you know you did a cesarean section and your child is going to be unhealthy because of your choice. That is completely wrong because that is what was. that was, that was the, re, the the thing that uh, ultimately came out of that video and when i uh, actually criticized it you, you can see the comments a lot of women were were just relieved reading my my post so i call out everything so i call out uh, see if if i am wrong like for example there was this post that i made on sucralose where i said that you know in, uh, sucralose consumption can cause cancers and dna damage and all that so a, a cardiometabolic doctor i mean a colleague of mine who saw that called me and said you know it's wrong because that study was very uh, it's the uh, erythritol not sucralose erythritol uh, non uh, uh, this uh, non sugar sweetener and he called me and said you know that erythritol study was actually quite bad uh, it's not accurate so your post is actually misleading i corrected myself i told people i'm sorry because this guy told me the uh, study was bad and uh, this is the real thing so don't worry about erythritol in the current recommended doses it's fine i corrected myself most of these other guys don't do it they put up the misinformation even if you tell them what is right they just keep it there so that they are the ones who i, I have a, i don't have a problem with them i have a problem with what they uh, the the kind of confusion that they uh, saw into the minds of uh, the already confused public so that is why i i uh, call out those misinformation so doctors have to be consistent in giving uh, advices and it should always be backed with evidence so if you see my post i'll inadvertently put lot of links to studies and real quality evidence there none of these people do that dr pal manikam just comes and say something and is goes and he cooks up cooks up some stories and some humor in it and people actually consume that and uh, there is no actual scientific research a lot of that is circulated on whatsapp family group. exactly so this is why uh, it's n- not just the doctor community i think doctor communities uh, doctors should also be responsible in what the kind of messages that they are giving out that is very important just i mean i'm i'm happy that lot of doctors are actually teaching there is a lot of medical education happening but there are these real influential uh, accounts uh, putting up a lot of wrong information too agreed that you're doing it on twitter now when people try to engage with you engage in a uh, in a way that uh, a layman is trying to say something on your posts you absolutely bash them yeah. right and i have a lot of screenshots i've taken for you call people dumbo you call this and that the point is that i heard you say that i have done 17 years of study and not for someone a ca to come and say you are wrong 
But the point is that you are an expert in your field. If I'm trying to make a point, uh, you have to understand I'm not an expert. I'm just giving that healthy blood for me is working. For example, as simple as that. Right. But the way you respond, I will never engage with your post again. Right. Okay. Aren't you creating this thing on Twitter that if I respond, ultimately either you will, I mean, either it is sarcasm, humor, or you're bashing that guy. Um. So this, uh, I think this is one of the commonest. Uh, response or comments that I receive even under my posts where they say that you know you are too brash, you are too aggressive, you are rude, you are arrogant, you are egomaniac and <laughs> stuff like that. So I mean if you look at uh, my posts and my responses or the way I respond to people at the beginning, if you go back in the timeline about 2019-2020, you'll see that I'm actually responding to everything that people are saying. So, uh, I mean, I do this. So, somebody, I'll say that, you know, Ashwagandha does not work for you because of this, this, this scientific study. Somebody will say, no, it's worked for me. Mm -hmm. So, I'll say that, no, that is a personal anecdote. That is not as an anecdotal fallacy. This is what it is. And I'll put up a picture saying, what is anecdotal fallacy? So, they'll just keep on rolling with that topic where it's something known as circular reasoning. So, they have decided that it is good because it is good for them and they'll keep on going about it. So, this kind of responses or this kind of discussion that happens on the internet or on Twitter very commonly this is something known as sea lining okay sea lining so sea lining is a kind of trolling activity which I consider the worst they will ask you something that is remotely related to that and then they'll take you to some other topics branch it out and ultimately it'll come to a place where it's all messed up that is when I understood what trolling was what harassment is, what are the different types of trolling. So now, when I see somebody ask me a question, so if you ask, look at my responses now, you will see that I do respond properly to a lot of people too. It's not like I'm responding to everybody, I'm abusing everybody who responds under my post. No. You will see that I target specific people. And most of them are anonymous accounts. Mm. Most of them always start with a kind of bias. So I don't, I don't bother about them or I don't care about them thinking that you know, I was rude or arrogant or whatever. And I, I want them to go away. I don't want them to come. Things you know, in, in bad faith actually, but masking it as good faith. Mm. And a lot of responses and comments that I get under my posts are, 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 are basically sea lining. But a lot of others who, I mean, today mornings, today morning only I responded with proper evidence and all to a lot of uh, people's responses because I know they are doing it for good faith. They want to know more about it. But you get a lot of hate as well on, on social media. Yeah, I mean, hate is from different angles. I mean, yeah, see, I mean, I've been doing this, I mean, especially from, from an alternative medicine point of view, I've been putting up a lot of evidence from my own work, my own published research. It's nothing anecdotal. It's all based on studies, years of studies. And uh, not a single person has actually proven the contrary. Like when I say that, you know, Giloy herb causes liver injury and we have this data, multinational trial on it. Mm. Nobody has actually shown me a multinational trial to show that it's safe. Right, but what will, they, what will they do? They'll say that, you know, Gilo is part of Ayurveda, so you are anti-Ayurveda. Now, Ayurveda is from the Vedas, so it's Hinduis, Hinduism. So now you are anti-Hindu, you are Hindu-phobic. So it goes that way. So I am not bothered about that anymore. So it doesn't bother you at all? Absolutely not. Why should I be bothered about it? Do there are get, people like that. Do you get threats as well? A lot of threats. Most people who follow me on Twitter uh, know that uh, there was this huge um, issue that was blown out of proportion by this uh, Hindu activist uh, regarding my post on uh, Patanjali. Mm. So what happened was that uh, the Supreme Court uh, said that you know Patanjali's posts were advertisements were misleading and if they did it again they would they would uh, find them a crore for crore, each crore per, per, per product. product per ad and uh, I put that up as a tweet. Uh, Baba Ramdev actually uh, came back with a video saying that you know they have not done anything like that everything is uh, with the facts and truth. So I put a post of him mm. Posing with uh, cow urine saying that it causes liver, it, it cures liver cirrhosis. Mm. Now, I'm a hepatologist. Mm. If, if cow urine cures liver cirrhosis, I'll be the first person to prescribe it. Because I don't want my patients to go for a 20 lakh uh, transplant. Right. So that was all misleading. So I said that, you know, Bamba, he's lying between his teeth and uh, he's put up all these misleading advertisements and I put it up. So that went really viral. So then these guys took it up and they gave it a complete communal angle because of which I got a lot of death threats. Okay. So I was happy sitting in my nice OPD in the uh, in the in the hospital, uh, which where everybody just could enter my room and discuss with me. So I don't I don't have any security outside who will stop anybody from coming and talking to me in my OPD. 
So anybody can just come in. Any doubts they want, they can clarify and they can go. So it's, it's a very free OPD. Now, I have been forced to sit inside my smaller office where there is security outside and not everyone can get in. Just the patient and a family member can come in. So just see what has happened. That, that, that goodwill protocol or routine that was going on is now completely disrupted because of these death threats. Because I have complained about this to the Kerala police and they are investigating him. So that they will file an FIR and start investigating him. So they said at, for the next three months you please move inside. So, so are you scared doctor? I am not scared but my family is very scared of it. Uh, my brother, my sister, they all follow me on Twitter. Mm. So they will see this death threat there. Obviously they will feel concerned. So I have to take everyone's opinion and uh, suggestions. So that is why I, I follow certain uh, rules and regulations as per my advice I get from around also. So that is why I have moved inside and uh, you know just for everyone's happiness and so they are all settled and they know that I am safe. Your lab also got vandalized sometimes. Yes, that was in 2019, 2020. Uh, that was vandalized by homeopaths. Hmm. They came all the way from North Kerala and attacked my uh, lab. It's, it's not my lab, it's actually a third party lab where all the medications that we retrieve from our patients, uh, homeopathy preparations, uh, herbal formulations, they analyze for us, uh, for a fee that we give them. And uh, that lab, uh, the address was leaked somehow. And uh, they came all the way in a jeep uh, there and started heckling the security, started uh, abusing and harassing the lab members and all that. So after that, I stopped my services uh, with that particular lab and moved on to another lab, which they are catering to my needs even now, um, which is anonymous. They don't know about that lab now because I've kept it anonymous. I don't want them to also go through the same. So these kind of physical uh, harassments has definitely happened, not to me, but to the to my partners and the people who are uh, you know uh, collaborating with me also so where are you going doctor now so now what i have done is that see i mean uh, from 2016 17 onwards i have been uh, spending a lot of uh, my own money from our own group's money uh, analyzing all these products and doing all of these studies and publishing it for uh, people I, I don't think people understand the the burden that we take as doctors, see I mean doctors have their own burdens when it comes to clinical practice. I am talking about burden above it. Mm. So what we do is for us to show with evidence that something is harmful, we have to uh, we have to do it in a specific way. That is a scientific method, right? So for that we need to invest a lot of time and money. Um, since 2017 we have analyzed about 380 plus uh, alternative medicine products. We have spent crores of money doing that. And this money has not come from patients or any pharmaceutical company. It has come from our own pockets. So my dad gives me his part of his salary. Uh, there are some clinical research uh, personnel in my unit. They said that, you know, we give part of our salary. So we collect money and ultimately we analyze these products for our patients who give it to us. And also I have analyzed products for free for doctors who send uh, samples from other parts of the country also to us. So we do even that. So we have been doing that for a very long time. And now it's reached a position where we are not able to do it anymore. Because see, I have my EMIs to pay. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I just, uh, I was confident enough to buy my own car just seven months back. That I will, I will be able to pay my EMIs and I can get a car. So I got a new car. That's the first time. Otherwise, my car and everything, they were, they were gifts from my father-in-law and my dad. I have never, I could never buy it because I was never earning so much. And even if I was earning, I was also investing a lot of that money uh, for public health work. And uh, this can't go on because my children, they are growing up and they need their education and all that. So now where I'm going is that I have actually stopped uh, doing this kind of public health works, spending my own money and I'm looking at uh, doing this at a large, on a larger stage. So I, me as a person, I want that to become a group where as a group, we will manage and we will work towards improving public health, including funding options. So that is why we have this uh, group known as MESH, which is Mission for Ethics and Science in Healthcare. Okay. A group of people from Kerala, also Malayali is outside of Kerala, a uh, rationalist group where there are scientists, police officers, lawyers, common men, physicians, physicists, molecular biologists, you name it, we are all there. There are about 28 to 30 of us in that group. And we have registered this society in, under the Society's uh, Inform uh, Act. And uh, we are starting to uh, plan 
uh, this public health works that I was doing from my personal level, level, we are going to do that at a much bigger level because we are now a society and a group. So it's no more me alone. Now this group has come into the picture. So that is how this is going now. And as a first uh, project that we are doing, we did this project known as Placebo Project. Okay. Where we have analyzed about 134 homeopathy formulations sold in the market. Mm -hmm. Three types of homeopathy formulations. One is classical dilutions. That is what homeopaths say, uh, put 10 to 20 drops in the water and drink. That is classical dilutions. Proprietary formulations, which these private homeopathy uh, manufacturers make on their own. And the third is mother tinctures, which are homeopathy starting products, which homeopaths actually prescribe when they are not supposed to prescribe. So you get these mother tincture based syrups and all that that people take as homeopath, uh, homeopathic formulations. So we have analyzed all these three groups, 134, it's spent about 6 lakh rupees because the members have pulled in. And uh, our results will just, our results are bonkers. Okay, let's talk about homeopathy. What is homeopathy? Where did it come from? And the principle behind it, which you say is flawed, I've read about it. Uh. And uh, so that we can settle this <laughs> once and for all. What is homeopathy? I think it's the biggest mistake humankind has ever made. That is what homeopathy is actually. So when uh, in the 1800s, when medicine was not, you know, we never knew about anatomy, physiology, we were unsure about what was happening with disease, diagnosis, prognosis, no idea. So at that time, uh, at that time, the physicians used to treat patients in very crude forms. So for example, if somebody has a headache, they would hit them on the head. Uh, if somebody has very bad headache, they would do something known as strapping, where they put holes in the skull. Uh, if somebody had seizure, they would think that it is you know demons causing it, and they would let the blood out. That is known as uh, bloodletting, hmm. or they would use leeches to suck out the bad blood and things like that. So that is that was a crude form of medicine that was practiced in early 1800s, medieval times. That is allopathy. So the term allopathy was actually coined by the guy who invented homeopathy. So allopathy is not modern medicine. It has nothing to do with scientific medicine. It was a crude form of medicine that was practiced centuries ago when there was no uh, light bulb also invented. So homeopathy was invented and written at a time when there was no light bulb. So you can imagine how primitive it is. Ayurveda is even more primitive than that. So we'll come to that. No, but the counterpoint is ki purani cheez hai to achhi hai purva chhaya chhaya. That is hai, appe a, appeal to antiquity, no? Yeah. That's <laughs> just because uh, your ancestors did it. Uh, but Doesn't ancestors did right. not live for more than 25 years. That people don't <laughs> realize that we are living for 70, 75 years Correct. now. And uh, uh, so at that time, uh, this person Samuel Hanneman, who was actually a physician at that time, so he he said that you know these crude forms of treatments are not good. People are suffering. They are giving them more suffering. So let's devise something that is very gentle on them. So what he did was, he made three, I mean he identified three principles. Uh, one is the law of similia, which is the like cures like. So he identified that from this, from his experience with cinchona, which is that bark from a tree, which is used in treating malaria. And uh, what happened was that when he took cinchona, he started developing shivers, shivering and fevers and all that. And that was also found to uh, cure the fevers al also. So he said that, you know, if, so, if it takes something that leads to a particular set of symptoms, that will actually cure it also. So like cures like. Second is if you dilute substances so much that there is no starting compound or a molecule of the starting compound identified in the ultimate dilutional product, the essence of that will be there and that essence will help you get cured of your diseases. Right, so this is the second third, second uh, principle. And the third is something known as vitalism. So that is the vital force theory, where they say that there is some life force flowing in your body. Mm. And that life force, even though nobody can actually show you where it is and what it is, uh, the imbalance in the life force leads to these diseases. And all of these medicinal energy will actually balance your life force. So that is the three principles of homeopathy. I sound like I'm talking about some chapter in Harry Potter. <laughs> it's not. It is, it's homeopathy. And based on these three principles, uh, Samuel Hanneman started using homeopathy as gentle healing. So, uh, apart from India, are there countries which are practicing homeopathy? Who of course, of course. I mean, it was it's it's it started off in Germany, yeah. France, where Samuel Hanneman is actually died and he's buried there. Huge uh, homeopathy practice, and then in India. I think in India there are two big pockets for homeopathy. One is Kerala, and uh, one is West Bengal. Beauty of homeopathy is that. Uh, Every, everybody who claims that they have improved from using homeopathic formulations, 
were in fact having self-limiting conditions. People don't realize it. But is homeopathy the biggest placebo effect? Because you're yeah. saying the second principle is the dilution principle, yeah. which I read about. Yeah. And we're saying the the thing that actually is used to cure is actually no more in that yeah. methi goli, whatever, yeah. that sweet tablet, yeah. right? No, it's really alcohol. People make a mistake that homeopathy is just that goli. Actually, what they prescribe most commonly are those dilutional formulations and it's pure alcohol. It's 90% alcohol. So everybody who's been microdosing mm. with alcohol needs to know that it was actually alcohol they have been taking and not... Uh, in the pills or in the liquid form? Liquids. Liquid. Even, even the pills, they douse it with alcohol. Because your life energy is in the alcohol. So is solvent. it written in the uh, ingredient section, ethanol? Of course. Most of the homeopathy formulations they'll write. 90%, 40%, 60%. You can see, I mean, somebody who goes and looks at a homeopathy liquid formulation, at the back it will be written the alcohol volume. V by V, volume by volume. It will be 90% some of them. Crazy. And people finish one or two bottles in two weeks time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so homeopathy is a sham. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's also a placebo effect kind of. Yeah. Thing, yeah. Right? So this placebo, I think people need to understand something more than that. Because when you say that placebo effect and you don't, you don't stop there. Placebo means no drug. Yeah, yeah, here there can be side effects also. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, a, it's, a, mm. it's a dummy thing, mm. right? It's a dummy. So when you, when you use placebo in a clinical trial, that means you are not treating the patient with anything. Mm. So when you say placebo effect, that it in fact Got it. Make, make, it in fact means that your disease was self-limiting. Mm. That is why it has gone away. It has nothing to do with homeopathy or placebo. Mm. So when you say the placebo effect has no therapeutic value, it has no treatment value. So I don't think we should even glorify or, uh, you know, reasonably uh, justify homeopathy use based on placebo effect because placebo means no treatment. Mm. So why do you want to waste time on those products, wasting money and time on something that even contains alcohol? So it doesn't make any sense. So, so do you think in the next couple of decades this is going to go away? Or homeopathy? Yeah. Absolutely not. It's going to be like a cockroach. The cockroach is the only thing that can survive a nuclear winter. Homeopathy is going to survive as long as human stupidity survives and human stupidity is infinite. <laughs> it's not going to go away. It will be there. Alternative medicine, everything is going to be there. But I think slow and steady, people, more number of people will understand that how it is negatively impacting them. Not just health-wise, but even monetary-wise. It's a waste of money for a lot of people. But you're taking on a lot of big guns, right? We spoke about Patanjali. Homeopathic is also, like there are a couple of very big players in that. Uh, so doesn't that bother you or scare you? I mean, not from a personal this thing, but you are fighting cases right now. I am. Yeah, quite a lot. Uh, see, I mean, we can uh, do this two ways. One is I can just be your the patient's doctor and, uh, you know, do my 9 to 5 job and let it go. Whatever I want to educate, I can educate inside my OPD across the table and just be with it, done with it. Or I can be the people's doctor where... I want this to go at a level where there is import, where, where we give importance to preventive medicine also. So when I treat a patient in my OPD, that patient has already suffered and I am trying to lessen that suffering, it's damage control happening there. I don't want that patient in front of me. That is what real medicine is. That is preventive medicine. So when people say, and, and this is the most, this is the lamest comment that I receive sometimes under my post, they are saying that you are against Ayurveda and homeopathy because they are taking your business away and that is why your business is going down so you want to talk bad about them. But that is absolutely foolish because if I want to really increase my business, I would actually keep quiet. Because let people take Ayurvedic medicines, let people take homeopathy, alcohol, they will all come some problem to me at some point. And I can actually test them, I can admit them, I can make a lot of money. I mean, I, will, I won't even talk about these toxic herbs anymore. People come with liver failure. 20 lakh rupees liver transplant I can do, no? for my hospital, for my unit. So why am I talking about it? I'm talking about it because I don't want that business. I don't want people to suffer and come to me so for me to do damage control. Mm. And sometimes even damage control does not work. I've, I've lost kids because of herbal liver injuries. I've lost bread, winning, uh, bread, earning, uh, bread winners in the family because of uh, severe liver injury, because of herbal uh, medications and homeopathic formulations. They've died. So I don't want that. So that is why uh, I don't look at how big these guns are, even I have a small toy pistol, I am okay with it. But the thing is, I am fighting them from a scientific standpoint. And I think this is the most important aspect of medicine, that is preventive care. You don't, you don't uh, treat patients when they come with a disease, you want to tell them that how to prevent that disease from happening. And I think uh, taking on uh, this kind of big names 
is worth it. Even though I have to fight a lot of cases and all. But I'm not alone now. I was alone maybe like three or four years back where it was really suffocating and I had to fight a lot alone. Thanks to all my friends and followers on Twitter and other social media handles, they have been a big help to me because uh, the, the su defamation suits that I'm fighting now, they're all, they have all come to help me. I have not asked for help, but they themselves have come to me and they're helping me and I find that, uh, I mean, it was very soothing for me. So I don't think uh, this is a single person's fight anymore. I think people have taken it up. And uh, this is why taking on big guns and big names is not uh, an issue at all because I, eventually it is helping people. Okay. Doctor, can you talk about some of the cases against you? Or give, you, give us one example. What are these cases? There have been quite a bit of them, including police cases, court cases, and just legal litigation okay. cases from the lawyer's side. So, this is, I think one of the most uh, interesting one was the police case. Okay. So, we have this uh, very famous, locally well-known uh, Ayurveda company known as Pankaja Kasturi. So, he's like a poor man's Baba Ramde. Okay. Uh, so, they make a lot of these uh, uh, proprietary pills for arthritis. And in my uh, original peer reviewed published work on Ayurvedic herbals and liver injury, this particular product was there. It featured. And we analyzed it and we found high levels of arsenic in it. Yeah. And this was out in the public. So, uh, I mean, few months, no noise, nothing. And suddenly one day, uh, cops, uh, the police officers come to my OPD when I'm actually sitting and seeing patients and say, you need to question you. So I said, and I was not sure what was happening at that time. And then uh, they said that you know, there was an FIR filed against you mm. uh, by uh, a company's uh, managing director, which is this Pangaji Rasuri's managing director. His name is Harit Raghunaya. And uh, uh, he's a big guy here. And uh, he's a Patma Sri Award winner around. Uh, he uh, has given a complaint saying that you know this particular study was prepared in a way to defame him and his company and uh, this was a criminal defamation and this was a propaganda from my side and the police has come to investigate that. It's, a, it's an FIR mm. and uh, I sit with them and I'm teaching the police officers what a scientific study is, what a peer reviewed publication is and it was not just his product. We have analyzed close to 33 uh, products in that with a lot of other companies in it. So this is in no way a propaganda. This is a scientific study. So the police officers understood that and they let me off the book. But as part of that study, what that guy did was he uh, filed affairs against my co-authors also. Okay. So my pathologist who did the liver biopsy mm -hmm. uh, analysis and everything, uh, the, 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 the lab that did the, the analysis of the products, which was actually a lab under the government of Kerala only, Cochin University of Science and Technology, fantastic lab. Uh, their members, they are not part of the co-authorship because because we have in a scientific publication we have the principal uh, author and co-authors who help us in the publication. Cops actually went to the pathologist lab and uh, questioned him, asked him to show all the pathology specimens that you have uh, analyzed that was part of the study and all that. He got really flustered because I mean suddenly cops coming in and doing this and uh, that was a bad episode for me. See, for me, I, I expect a lot of noise coming from it and I was ready for it. But for my co-authors, it was a totally different mm -hmm. experience. I mean, they are just nice guys, real doctors, doing their work, 9 to 5 jobs, happy with content with what they do and their jobs. And suddenly this happens, you know, and they feel really bad about it. They feel harassed. And my pathologist left the country. Oh. Yeah, so he said, I'm not going to work here anymore. He found a good place to work out of India and now he's there. He's not come back. And uh, because of that, my team got disrupted. Mm. So I, I lost a good pathologist. And But then we, we do publish. We did a lot of publications even after that. But now the senior pathologists who are part of my analysis team, they said that please don't put our names in your paper. We'll give you whatever you want. Mm. We'll give you images. We'll give you, uh, you know, results. But don't put our names in, our, in your papers. It has reached that state. And uh, the second one was very interesting. Uh, when I spoke about a particular herb induced liver injury, which is Giloy liver injury from actual evidence point of view, the first uh, report was actually from Jaslok Hospital in Mumbai, where they identified a series of patients with Giloy herb and liver injury, or demand hepatitis, they called it. Herb induced or demand hepatitis. And once that was out, I spoke about it in social media, especially in YouTube and all that. And uh, a group of Ayurveda uh, People, I mean, in the sense, it's it's an organization known as Ayurveda Association of India or something like that, AMAI or something. And uh, they complained to the Prime Minister's office that uh, I am 
the guy sitting here and defaming Ayurveda system. Mm. Uh, the Prime Minister's office uh, sent that complaint letter, forwarded the complaint letter to the National Medical Council, NMC. And NMC forwarded that letter to the Ayush Ministry. <laughs> and I get two letters, one from NMC and one from uh, the Ayush Ministry. My modern medicinal council is here, Kerala State Medical Council. And Ayush Ministry is, has empowered the State Ayush Council here. So I get uh, letters from both saying that you are going to be investigated for defaming Ayurveda. So I think, what the hell is happening? You know, my own modern medicine council is investigating me for talking about a scientific paper on herbal liver injury. And they asked me to come to the modern medicine council hall and face a, uh, a panel uh, and, you know, give my uh, reasonings, justifications of what I did. So I said, I'm not going to come anywhere. You know, this is just a waste of my time. And I gave them a nice, full, detailed letter on everything that has happened and why I said this and this is the proof of saying it and all. I submitted it to them. Fortunately, people sitting there understood it and they left, left me off the hook. So the uh, State Medical Council did not come up behind me after that. And this case was dropped because ultimately they found out that it is uh, all from the scientific standpoint. Now the homeopathy department, the council, uh, knew about it. So at that, that was a time when I was also speaking against something known as Arsenicum album, which is actually homeopathy formulation, which was promoted by the central government and the state government as a preventive for COVID, even when the studies by homeopaths actually showed it does not work. So there is a study pub done by homeopathy community published in a journal called Homeopathy, which shows that Arsenicum album does not work for COVID. So it was promoted by who, but? Central government, state government. Central government, you mean Ayush? Union, yeah, Ayush ministry has mentioned it in the guidelines for, you know, the integrated guidelines that they had. And the state government, the Kerala government, promoted it as a mass uh, COVID preventive, even for children, school-going children. And that actually happened in Kerala. They gave large numbers of uh, children, school-going children, asking a album in the uh, schools and uh, colleges and all that. So I spoke that, you know, this is actually not right. Studies have shown it doesn't work. Plus, you may get arsenic toxic, uh, intoxication because of the toxicity because of it. And most of these formulations have alcohol. They are not medicines. And this became a big issue because that video of mine became very viral. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was in Malayalam. So the Homeopathy Council sent a uh, grievance uh, letter, complaint letter to the Kerala State Medical Council again. Because we have a combined council here now. So the modern medicine, Ayush, everybody sits together. And uh, they all scratch each other's back. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they get a complaint like this, they have to do something about it. So they started investigating me again on the homeopathy uh, complaint. So this was another big issue that I faced. And they were just harassing me right, left and center, sending me letters, come to the council, come to the council, face the panel. I mean, why should I? I have not broken any medical code of ethics. In fact, I was standing up for the constitution of India, where it says that people should be scientifically having a good temperament and you should teach people about scientific temperament. I was doing that. And ultimately, that is still ongoing, by the way. It is not uh, closed. You have a team of lawyers now, is it? <laughs> I have a, I have, I have pop-up lawyers. So I don't know where problems come. So <laughs> lawyers come from different places. But in Kerala, I have a team of lawyers who work uh, pro bono for me because they want. I mean, they they love the whole aspect of public health promotion and uh, education on because they, they and they work for us and they're part of the mesh team. Like I spoke before, the mission for ethics and science and healthcare. So they, they work for us. And this has been, this, this investigation is still ongoing. I have not heard back from them after that. Uh, I sent my lawyer to them to discuss with it. After that, uh, there is no update. Uh, something is going to come up someday. Uh, I'm sure about it. Uh, so this was the second one. And the third one is basically just, uh, you know, strong worded, uh, intimidating legal letters from big companies like Herbalife. So Herbalife sent me a letter uh, from a very, very famous uh, lawyer in Delhi. Uh, who said that I'm going to be sued for 1 million US dollars if I don't stop talking about Herbalife. So I said, you sue me, no problem, I'll keep talking about it. Mm. I have all the data, a, a, a lady has died because of your products, I treated that lady, I sent her for a liver transplant and she did not get a liver on time and she died. She left behind two young kids and a husband. Uh, they'll come and speak in the court on my behalf also. So please go for a, uh, sue me, I said. They did not come at me. What they did instead was go around me and then started threatening the journal, the editorial board and the publisher. So now when you look at from their angle of angle, the journal, the editorial board and the publisher, they don't have, yeah. they don't have the time to fight it at court. 
and the journal editors are government i mean the at the time the editor of the journal was actually a senior professor at pgh chandigarh mm. and uh, it was not up to him to you know take it yeah, up and spend yeah. money on lawyers and all so what they did they took the easy way out they said we are sorry we are removing the paper so money won there and science lost but in the process everybody came to know about that case mm. so that was the stray sign defect which was they tried to hide something and it this came out completely out in the open and now people know about uh, how bad uh, herbalife products are in fact i'm just i'm not talking about as an opinionated person who has published on one case report i'm talking about from a scientific standpoint where if you look at the latest meta analysis data that is uh, there there is a group in south america who has actually looked at all the herbal and dietary supplements related liver injury in the world so herbalife not comes under that herbal and dietary supplements so they found out that the commonest cause of herbal and dietary supplement uh, liver injury in the world proprietary wise is herbal life products wow yeah it is it is a truth i can show papers i have actually put it up on uh, uh, twitter also after which herbal life again sent me one legal letter saying that <laughs> i have i am disparaging their uh, products uh, and uh, they will it's a cease and desist notice i just threw it in the waste bin <laughs> and i kept talking about herbal life so let's go to direct correlation between ayurvedic herbs and liver and you've spoken about it yes right so uh, have there been studies done before you got into uh, this of long term effects of ayurvedic herbs on liver or your study was the first one to have uh, uh, come up with some results um so this um, whole aspect of uh, the herb, herbal formulations or herbs used in ayurveda causing liver injury liver failure and death was not known uh, not long before so when you look at the data from 2005 2007 those data are mostly on quality of ayurvedic formulations so you'll see lot of uh, publications on how ayurvedic formulations are contaminated with lead arsenic mercury and things like that but no actual patient or clinical correlation now that was happening since about maybe 10 or 15 years before i started my work and there are isolated case reports of ayurvedic formulations harming a single patient or a couple of patients so these are just small reports that it published so what my paper did in 2017 18 was that we found a series of patients large numbers of patients who have been harmed by ayurvedic formulations and specific herbs in ayurvedic formulations that either led to them dying or getting a liver transplant and some of them actually improved with the supportive care also can we talk about it if you are okay talking about yes. it what exactly was it in layman terms what did they consume what happened and what are the findings so this particular study uh, uh, so i i basically came back to kerala uh, to do more research on alcoholic liver disease that that was my interest on stool transplants and microbiome and all that but what i saw was that there was this particular group of patients who were coming to me with new onset jaundice an acute onset jaundice with hepatitis without any identifiable cause So when somebody comes with jaundice and very bad liver test, we look at what is causing it. So we'll see it is hepatitis A, hepatitis E, hepatitis B, autoimmune liver disease. There are so many diseases that can affect the liver acutely. So when we looked at alcohol use, even old world painkillers, some prescription drugs that we give, for example, anti-seizure medications that can all harm the liver. High dose of paracetamol. None of these were there in these patients. None of them. so we had a whole checklist and we found out that you know none of these were there and this they still had severe hepatitis and jaundice then we looked back in retrospect and asked them what was happening in the last 3 months or 6 months that before you developed this so a lot of them said that you know we looked at diet we asked them supplements so some of them actually started saying that you no know, we were on this herbal supplement so i said why were you not telling us about this herbal supplement because they said it's a herbal supplement it's not a medicine it's like food it's natural so we thought it's not important for us to tell you then we looked back at all these patients and found out all of them had were consuming some or the other form of alternative medicine and most of them was from ayurvedic practice and once we retrieved these formulations we analyzed them so that was also the first time somebody was doing it so these are these are formulations that actually harmed in real patients are giving us those formulations and we are analyzing them and during analysis we found out some of these had actually toxic contaminants or adulterants very high levels of heavy metals and all and some of them actually had inherently toxic herbs for example uh, giloy ashwagandha uh, something known as uh, garcinia which is malabar tamarind so all of these herbal products were also there so we published this study as the first larger series which showed that ayurvedic herbals as alternative medicine forms can 
can harm the liver to such an extent that people can die so what's what's up with that ashwagandha yeah, because so, it's a very generic thing to take ashwagandha right it's not like if you have something that it is prescribed i know so, a lot of people who just yeah so uh, ashwagandha is been taken most commonly for uh, sleep mm. and stress reduction and also something known as general wellness even though people don't know what general wellness means mm. and uh, some of them actually take it for uh, muscle uh, strengthening and uh, performance improvement now uh, ashwagandha related liver injury has been identified in the west because the west has a lot of ashwagandha intake is it huge but uh, ashwagandha per se uh, there was a study from iceland along with the united states drug induced liver injury network where they mentioned five cases where ashwagandha has caused something known as cholestatic hepatitis so ashwagandha is very specific when it comes to injuring the liver it has a chemical a plant chemical known as withanone and withanone what it does it it goes and attaches itself to the liver cell dna in the nucleus and it damages the dna and the liver cell dies so this can happen with the liver cell and also the bile duct cell so there is something known, we have bile ducts also which makes bile inside the liver so bile duct cells are different liver cells are different ashwagandha damages both and what that leads to is something known as bile stagnation inside the liver and when that happens people start getting jaundice with itching severe itching along with the yellowness of the eyes and all that that is known as cholestatic hepatitis and along with this they get severe pain abdomen so this is the only herb that can cause severe jaundice with itching and pain so it will feel like you have gallbladder stones but when you look at it your gallbladder will not have any stones liver will look slightly swollen but the biopsy will say that there is damage to the bile duct cells and the liver cells this is prolonged use of ashwagandha even with uh, short term use it can happen because ashwagandha related liver injury is something what we call as idiosyncratic which means any dose can harm any duration can harm what are your thoughts on the ayush ministry it is needed okay ayush ministry is definitely something that is really required but they should not be doing the stuff they are doing they should be regulating instead of promoting now in india we published me and other isolated groups clinical researchers published more than 300 cases of giloy liver injury you won't believe it there are three, almost 300 cases of giloy liver injuries published in peer reviewed studies from india and i wrote a letter to the prime minister's office saying that you know there is a giloy liver injury thing happening because of covid promotion and some people are actually more at risk for developing liver injury because of giloy and they are the ones with autoimmune disorders for example people with rheumatoid arthritis people with uh, something so a disease known as lupus people with hypothyroidism people with diabetes or any people any person with an underlying autoimmune liver disease or other autoimmune disorder they are at a higher risk of developing something known as herb induced autoimmune liver injury because of giloy the ministry of in a in a better world in a scientifically progressive society the ministry of family and health i mean uh, they'll come together along with the ministry of ayush make a joint statement saying that people with these 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 condition please avoid taking giloy we don't want you to get into trouble i sent the letter and the letter response came back from a homeopath sitting in the ayush ministry not even an ayurved mm. saying that giloy has been used since last 2000 years so it's fine when i'm giving them almost 200 cases of reports from india and the the worst part is that the ayush ministry and the government of india put out a statement on on the press trust of india they bring out these statements right saying that giloy uh, every claim related to giloy leading to liver injury is misleading i mean i stopped it there so i knew that the real machinery that is supposed to help us ayush ministry they will not they will never do it there is no point going there the, what they doing is really endangering a lot of people's lives it's just crazy and see we are seeing it because all these really sick cases all these liver injuries they come to us so if somebody takes a herbal medicine and they develop o jaundice or whatever they don't go to homeopath or uh, ayurved because suddenly their real uh, uh, real intelligence kicks in and they'll go to a modern medicine hospital and we diagnose we analyze and we identify and then we report it and it becomes like we are anti ayurveda anti homeopathy because we are seeing the end uh product of everything that has been unscientifically promoted by them so is there no space for alternate medicine there is lot what of is space the, what is the space for alternate business <laughs> that's it it's business also it's a good thing for tourism so if you look at kerala as per se uh you don't see a lot of people actually coming into kerala to get 
medical treatment for whatever. Like you said, you come for a massage, you come for that experience of shirodhara, whatever, whatever, right? You have that Ayurvedic diet and all that. That's a fantastic industry to, you know, promote because that's 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 that wellness that you are experiencing. It's it's something that everybody should or can experience. But when it comes to actually treating therapeutic actions from Ayurvedic industry and all, it is go going to create more harm only. So in that, in the medical space, there is no... Absolutely not. Nothing. Nothing. No Ayurveda, nothing. Nothing. I mean, I, I'm, I'll be happy to correct myself if somebody shows me a single traditional Ayurvedic product that has gone through clinical phases 1 to 4 with a level 4 or 5 evidence for any disease condition recommended by any clinical society in India or outside India and I will take everything I say about Ayurveda. Yeah. Lot of revenue yeah. from, from the alternative medicine industry regarding advertisements in print, visual and social media. They will not talk about it. So this is the reason why people say that do, don't you have any other work to do? You just keep on you know barking about alternative medicine all day in and day out on the social media. This is why there has to be somebody who does this consistently because the Misinformation is consistent. Nobody is talking about that. Misinformation, every day you see new misinformation, completely dangerous misinformation is happening all around you. So there has to be some voice which is consistently saying that, you know, this is not right, this is not right. That is exactly what I am doing. It's not because I don't have any, any other work to do. I have a lot of work to do, but I am stuck with so many things. I mean, I am overcommitted and juggling too many balls at a time. Let's understand what is the meaning of evidence-based medicine. Yeah, so I think evidence-based medicine is there and science-based medicine is there, right. So evidence-based medicine is the principle and science-based medicine is the method. Okay. That is the difference. So evidence-based medicine is you have in principle evidence to uh, recommend or approve a particular treatment for a particular condition because you know that the benefits are much more than the risks. So that is evidence-based medicine. So evidence-based medicine does not mean that it is very safe. Everybody can, yes, let's all use it. That's not how we promote it. Evidence-based medicine means that the benefits are much more than the risk because we have studied it and it has been identified that in that particular dose, in that particular range, in that particular group, it works. And we can use that for bettering people's lives or patients' lives. With prescription. With prescription. You can prescribe. Yeah. That is evidence-based medicine. Science-based medicine is a method. So science is a method. The scientific method is there. So in science-based medicine, you follow a particular uh, method to test, validate and replicate the benefits versus risk. So I am, uh, imagine I am a, 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 an Ayurveda company and I have a new product for headache. So I will do a study in uh, 100 people and I will say that, you know, my product reduces headache more than placebo or the standard of care. So let's all start using it. But I am the owner of that product, right? So there is a bias there. So I want some other group independently to confirm my uh, study. So somebody else will do it and say that, no, we did not get your findings. We got different findings. We say that we found that it is not useful. So that is where the scientific method comes. So scientific method does not mean that somebody says, so for example, look at Patanjali. Patanjali studies are all done by Patanjali only. Right. Nobody has... Uh, is there no other study? Uh, no Absolutely other agency no. which has done no, independent it's all, agency? it's all Patanjali. Patanjali's every single study is funded by Patanjali. By Divya Farman. <laughs> I mean, and, and they are the ones also promoting it, no? Yeah. Who else is promoting it? Yeah. They do their study, they publish their own study, they pay their own money to publish a study, and they, then both of those fellows sit and promote their own products <laughs> on, on their channels, Asta channel, I think. So they do that. So that is why we need validation replication. None of these products are validated. or That is why the scientific method comes in. So just because uh, Ramdev said that, you know, all our works are scientifically proven, <laughs> it doesn't mean that way. What is functional medicine? Is it a new fad? Functional medicine is, uh, is also an alternative medicine, by the way. It is not mainstream medicine. It is also uh, what I call as glorified quackery. Okay. Yeah. So uh, basically, if you, um, uh, you have a street dog and uh, you, you, you cover it with a, a Dalmatian coat, printed coat, it does not become a Dalmatian. Right, it's a street dog only. So that is what functional medicine is. So functional medicine is basically you have a lot of proven, uh, unproven uh, therapies and disproven therapies and they mix both and then they claim that they treat the root cause because they are going to balance a lot of things within you 
and they are the only ones who will keep claiming that they can cure a lot of things. So what they do is they are MPPs doctors, no, they're legit, but they practice in functional medicine. So functional medicine is they'll say that you have a bad immune, weak immune system, so they'll give you some herbs for it. Then they'll say that your gut health is not correct, so they'll uh, ask you to change your diet. Then they'll say that you have a lot of inflammation in your body. I mean, everybody has inflammation in their body. It's a normal thing only. And because of that inflammation, you need to do something, uh, you know, practical. So they'll add yoga to it. And then they'll say that, you know, you have a very weak digestion. And then they'll prescribe some modern medicine for it. So it's a mixed bag of a lot of things without any actual beginning or ending. In fact, a lot of patients go through a lot of testing as part of functional medicine and lose a lot of money. And functional medicine is not something that is very old, it is quite new. It is founded in the year 1990s uh, by a guy called Jeffrey Bland. Okay. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's all it goes. Jeffrey Bland was a guy who first put up the Institute of Functional Medicine. And he is the guy who, who decided that, you know, uh, healthcare is completely uh, bogus, everything is a uh, uh, conspiracy. So this is the real healthcare. We have to treat everything from the root and we have to treat all these imbalances and they started doing all of this stuff. It is not a valid or recommended or approved form of treatment in any scientifically progressive uh, nation. So it's basically quackery. Please don't go to a functional medicine doctor. They are not doctors. Even if they have a background of being a legit MBBS? Absolutely not. It's like there is a, a lawyer commits uh, murder. Just because it's a lawyer, you, you don't say it's a lawyer, no, let's just leave him off the hook. No, it's not like, it's, 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 it doesn't work that way. So somebody who's done MBBS should be actually doing scientific medicine only, not, not functional medicine. Because, they, because our country has a lot of issue with uh, catering to the large numbers of postgraduates that are coming in. Uh, people branch out into these kind of, yeah, and then they lose it on the way. That's, that's, that's the only reason. I mean, if we can uh, include all of them in a good super specialty or a specialty training program, I think these, these kind of smaller uh, quackery will go away. And functional versus integrated? Integrated is also this whole... Because integrated medicine is just there for the business. So you uh, mix something that works with something that does not work and claim, falsely give credit to the thing that does not work as working along with it. So this is very, very interestingly, I mean, I, I have modified the original version. I say that, you know, if you mix cow urine with apple juice, the cow urine does not get better. The apple juice gets worse. That is integrative medicine. That is exactly integrative medicine. That is what they do. A lot of money waste. I just want to understand your perspective on the overall medical infra in the country, right? Uh, is there enough being done on R&D? Is there enough? You also spoke about that why uh, MBBS doctors are getting into integrated, uh, sorry, uh, alternate yeah. uh, medicine, right? Because we don't have enough for them. Uh, how many graduates are coming in? How many people are applying? How many graduates are coming in? How many jobs yeah. we have, right? So overall, Indian medical uh, healthcare system, what are your thoughts there? So I, I, I think uh, the whole ecosystem is completely messed up. Uh, there is no real direction into how, uh, what's, uh, people are getting, taking what they're getting. So there are not enough specialty and super specialty training programs in the country to cater to the large numbers of postgraduates that we are creating, or the graduates that we are creating, uh, cater to the need. For example, there are certain uh, areas which are super saturated, for example, cardiology. Mm. No, a lot of, very less people take up cardiology now because cardiology has split into interventional cardiology, clinical cardiology and a lot of things. Take the example of gastroenterology. My dad is a gastroenterologist. Everybody who used to uh, treat liver patients maybe about 10 or 15 years before were all gastroenterologists only. Mm -hmm. But now what has happened? Gastroenterology has split into hepatology. Mm -hmm. So I am not a gastroenterologist, I am a hepatologist. So my training is all in hepatology. So I can cater very specifically to that group of patients. So this kind of split up of the specific uh, branches in medicine is not there in India. No, but the incentive is also not there for, you, are a, you have done DM in hepatology, yeah. right? So to do MBBS and then MD and the DM is how many years of study? <sighs> a lot. It's, uh, so I mean, include... If you consider no breaks in between. Uh, if you consider no breaks, it's uh, 5 plus 3 plus 3. Okay. So that's 11 years of... With, with breaks, I have studied 15 years. 15 years. So what is the incentive? I'm, I'm just saying from an incentive. Yeah, point. so now... Uh, the whole aspect of medicine is changing. It's not. It's no more the generalized, generalist point of view of treating patients. Even patients have become like that. 
So somebody has abdominal pain, they don't go to a general physician, they'll go to a gastroenterologist only. Mm -hmm. Somebody has jaundice, they directly come to me, to hepatology. That jaundice may be because of many other causes, not, not only liver, but they come to me. So that, you, you have to cater to that kind of a pattern. And that is not there in India, because a lot of people, they, they, they just keep writing. For example, there are my juniors, there are guys who are still writing to get into a DM gastro course, and it's the fourth attempt and all that. Just see the numbers of years wasted. And when that happens, the quality of the doctors that come out reduces, because people will take whatever they feel like at some point, and their mind is not into it. And also, I think the infrastructure R&D, I mean, I'm not talk, even talking about R&D, because research and development, I think, even though a lot of central institutes do it, it's very, very less. The quality of output that comes from medical research from India, it's, it's, it's very less. It's not because they're not receiving funding, there is funding, but the drive to do something like uh, the, the way US or, the, or, or, uh, or Germany or you know, UK does, that drive is not there, because doctors are so busy seeing patients here. We have so many people to see, a lot of patient crowd. So it's not easy for somebody to, you know, uh, 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 take both together. Like, for example, what I do is, I'm a clinician scientist. I do research and I see patients. But what I do is, I have, I mean, it, it, it's a... The research part doesn't pay you, right? Or does it? Oh, absolutely not. I'm losing money in research. <laughs> because I'm not getting any funding from the kind of research that I do. I don't think anybody's going to fund me. Right. I mean, especially the government is not going to fund me. The government has a lot of funding options. So if they fund, we can carry on with this. But you look at the state of the researchers in India. So many of them are not even getting paid on time. I mean, I think this came out in the papers also. The PhD candidate, the PhD students, they're not getting paid. Yeah, yeah. So this whole aspect of research has now become a very, it's, it's a pipe, pipe dream for a lot of people. And managing clinical work along with research, it's not easy. Not every doctor has that, uh, that luxury. And especially doctors in the pu public sector. Mm -hmm. They see 200, 300 patients in a day. Here it's like, you are pushed into MBBS and then you swim, 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 swim. By the end of 15 years, you come out and you, know, you don't know what you're doing. Mm. That is what is happening to many of the students here. They are completely clueless about what they want to do and what they end up doing. No, also coming from a family of doctors, the public infra where, uh, like I have my cousin studying MD in uh, government institutes and I don't know how many long hour shifts you had, but I am surprised to see that they have uh, day duty, night duty, day duty, back to back, which becomes, I think, 36 hours and then they sleep for six hours and they're back to the duty. I, I don't know of any other profession, which is a specialized profession where this happens, right? I try to equate it with uh, commercial pilots where they have to sleep a certain number of hours before they take another flight. But yeah, I don't know. How many hours did you work? So I, I have worked for 36 hours. Yes. I mean, that mostly happens during your training. Yeah. But then if you are in a setup where you have to work with very low resources, but a lot of doctors in a lot of hospitals don't have that. So they don't have a junior or they don't have an assistant with them. So they have to do a lot of things. So what they do is they'll do OP, they'll see the IP, they'll come for emergencies, they'll, it's, it's crazy. And there are doctors who do that even in a senior position. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole requirement of doctors to rest this much so that their output is going to be better the next day is, even though it's maybe on paper, but in reality it does not happen. Because a lot of, we have a lot of brain drain even now happening. Because, uh, you know, after MBBS, after MD, people are looking at places they have, they have, rules and regulations to working. You know, you don't work like a donkey. I mean, you work like a donkey when you're supposed to work. But then beyond that, you have a life, you have your own uh, satisfaction with regards to clinical medicine or research work and everything. And there are a lot of places that cater to that. So they are going there because they have so much of opportunity. Why is it happening here? People don't want to work in the public sector anymore. They don't want to work in the suburban or rural areas. They don't want to work in real big corporate sectors also. There is no balance anywhere here. And a lot of the shouldering of public health in India is done by the private sector, especially when it comes to advanced treatments. I'm not saying that the public sector is absolutely useless, excellent. They do a lot of work. But I'm saying that a lot of shouldering of public health is still done by the private sector because, uh, I mean, it, it has been normalized that way. So I think we, if you have a very good public infrastructure with fantastic universities, good public funding, everything set in stone, a lot more people will remain in India and I think India can really become one of the biggest countries in medicine and research in the future. But not the way it is going right now. Not the alternate medicine. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, India still is, is currently the pseudoscience hell of the world. <laughs> not China. I just wanted to touch upon one of the researches that you did where uh, 
acute uh, alcoholic liver disease ah. which was published that's something that i want to talk about there are uh, there are there is a lot of new things happening in the field of hepatology and uh, this is particularly happening in alcoholic liver disease so i i my primary research is actually alcohol not uh, ayurveda i mean alcohol can harm the liver in different ways uh, you can have a simple fatty liver because of alcohol so when you stop alcohol in 2 weeks the fatty liver will go away so when you drink alcohol again the fatty liver will come back so that is alcoholic fatty liver it's the easiest to treat you just have to quit drinking second is something that uh, yeah i mean for for a doctor it's very easy uh, second is something that is known as uh, steatohepatitis. hepatitis that is the fat in the liver uh, causes inflammation in the liver and then you start having abnormal liver test that is alcoholic steatohepatitis now there is a severe form of that known as alcoholic hepatitis where uh, it's not just the inflammation but you start getting liver damage because of it and you will have uh, jaundice along with abnormal liver functions because of alcohol uh, liver injury so that is the most dangerous alcoholic hepatitis so if people uh, recover from that and they keep continuing to take alcohol then they will develop cirrhosis which is the permanent damage to the liver because of alcohol your liver is shrunken nodular and things like that if they still continue alcohol after getting cirrhosis they dead i mean they can die any time during any of these phases so if they still continue alcohol then they can have a recurrence of this alcoholic hepatitis on top of the cirrhosis that is known as acute on chronic liver failure aclf that is that has got a 28 day death rate of about 90% so 28 in 28 days 90% of people can die without a proper treatment or with non response to the proper treatment so in that particular group so i was very invested in that group of patients because nobody in the world knows how to treat them crazy tough group of patients to treat they give you nightmares because they die so rapidly and in the most most dreadful terrible way vomiting blood infections brain failure going into coma i mean it's it's a terrifying uh, uh, group of patients to treat in the icu so the treatment of choice since decades was to give them low dose of steroids because steroids will steroids is like a magic bullet that's why a lot of people use steroids in a lot of conditions because they are useful so when you give steroids you will reduce inflammation in the liver and that way you can reduce the liver uh, damage and jaundice will settle but not everyone will respond to steroids some of them actually develop complications on steroids because of infections or their liver damage is so much that steroids cannot even control it so what to do with that group so we say let us go liver transplant them easy to say no liver transplant because liver transplant is a, it's it's a big deal you need money you need a donor and you need both of them in on time because this group of patients will die very fast so so everybody will not have a donor and and uh, money ready so what they'll do they'll say that uh, you know uh, we'll take the risk and transplant so whoever has money and tra- the uh, donor they'll transplant but the biggest problem is because these patients have been drinking continuously and have recent drinks which has led them to alcoholic hepatitis and acute and chronic liver failure they'll drink if you liver. yes if you if you transplant them give them a new liver they'll drink again it's basically habit is it yeah it's 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 a disease see nobody wants to become an alcohol use disorder patient nobody is, uh, b- 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 is born saying that oh, okay i'll become an alcohol user no it's circumstances lot of things social factors environmental factors genetic factors it's a disease so we have to treat it so if you if you transplant this group of patients very high chance that they can go back to drinking again after getting a new liver i have my pa- I have I have had a lot of patients who have actually told me that i asked them why do you want to get transplanted so i expect an answer i want to uh, take care of my family i want to take care of my children i want to see them grow get them married no fellows have told me sir this liver will not tolerate any more alcohol i want a new one but this is, is real you are saying it's real and we take them off the list we don't transplant them because they'll destroy their new liver also the liver might be given by the wife or another family member why, why do you have to put them through the risk of surgery so those guys out of the list they die eventually there is nothing we can do about it and this is what happens so we we choose these people for transplant so everybody won't go for a transplant so eventually they will die without a transplant so what to do for them which is where my uh, study came in so this did not just come in one fine day so i was in uh, ilbs in delhi in my my university and uh, uh, my professor professor shiv sarin i mean i i am i am me because of him because the way he taught me about clinics clinical medicine and research is what uh, helped me look at uh, clinical medicine in a very different way and that is all because of him so he told me that uh, you know if you are going to do thesis i mean we have two theses there we have to do thesis uh, works there 
So if you're going to choose your thesis topics, uh, choose something that is going to benefit people, not something you know observational or whatever, something new, radical. So I was I was thinking, 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 and I was looking through a lot of basic science work at that time, and I found out that from France there were two studies done in mice, where they fed mouse alcohol. So yeah, men and mice, I mean even women drink, but <laughs> men and mice they have uh, they have this very common feature when it comes to alcohol. Both of them love alcohol. So mice will drink alcohol like humans do. So mm -hmm. when you expose them to alcohol, they want to drink more alcohol. So they have that thing about alcohol. And when they gave mice alcohol, they found out that in the presence of alcohol, uh, large numbers of bacteria in the in the body, especially in the intestines, were changing for the bad. So there are these good bacteria. See, we say good because we know their functions are good. Uh, it's not because they are actually good. They can become bad also at some point. But there are good bacteria and bad bacteria. And we know for sure that causes disease. So when in the presence of alcohol, the good guys were coming down, bad guys were coming up. Mm -hmm. And because of that, liver parameters were getting worse in the mice. That was the first study. So that study was done by Lopez, this lady. I mean, she is a fantastic scientific researcher, Lopez. Uh, she identified this, this is published in a journal called The Gut. Fantastic journal. Now, another group uh, did something more than that. So what they did was they fed mice alcohol and they found out that this bacteria was all changing and the liver functions were getting worse. So what did they do? They co-housed mm. that group of mice with another group of healthy So this group has no alcohol exposure, they are healthy. This group has alcohol exposure, they have bad livers and bad bacteria in the gut. Mice have a specific bad habit. They eat each other's feces. Okay. They are coprophagic. Okay. So you don't have to do stool transplants, take stool from them and feed them. They'll feed on their own. They'll just eat. So what happened was that when the alcohol liver disease mice ate the stool of the healthy mice, their microbiota in the gut started changing towards a healthy pattern and because of that, the liver injury started reducing. So this was my basic understanding that, you know, if you change the microbiome in the gut with healthy microbiome from a healthy person, there is a chance that alcoholic hepatitis can be uh, you know, to some extent reduced. So we did the first trial in humans after getting a lot of ethical clearance from the university. Uh, on 8 to 12 patients we did a trial where severe alcoholic hepatitis patients without the chance for a, uh, without response to standard medicines and without the chance for transplantation were given healthy stool from their own family members. Okay. So I still remember one of the wives of uh, a patient uh, thanked me for this protocol. I said, why? Uh, sir, this guy has been beating me up ever since we were married. He's been, he's been making my life shit. Now you are making him eat my shit. <laughs> so I, I love this protocol. This is fantastic. <laughs> she actually told me that, you know. And uh, I mean, we don't, we don't do that to, to patients. But then this is something that came up. And uh, what we did found out was when healthy stool, I mean, so we prepare this. It's not like we directly feed the stool. We process it, filter it, take out all the vegetable particles and it's a suspension. And we give it through a small tube paste in the, tube, uh, in the nose that goes into the small intestine. And when we did that for, for seven days, about 100 ml of fresh stool every day, by the end of one month, 88% of them survived. When, by the end of one month, 90% should have died. So this was the first study on stool transplant alcoholic hepatitis. And we did further studies on other groups of patients related to alcoholic liver disease. I have published about uh, three or four original papers on it. We also have a paper on acute and chronic liver failure where we showed that uh, uh, even stool transplant improves their outcomes. They are the toughest group of patients. They survive about 40 to uh, 55 to 60 percent of patients survived in the severe ACLF groups with stool transplant. We uh, termed our study, uh, I mean I still remember it, the title of the study was uh, only in the darkness can we see the stars. <laughs> right? Only in the darkness you can see the stars. And that was a study we did. So we did this fantastic work and this work has been now endorsed by the American College of Gastrology. You, have, you can actually see the guidelines on alcoholic liver disease management. This is mentioned as a salvage therapy, not to cure anything, but this can help salvage life. And later on if they require uh, liver transplantation, they can do that also. Because we don't, we don't let them die fast with this. I mean, I'm not saying that this can cure everything. It doesn't. We need more work and more research on it. Very interesting is not this. Very interesting is... When we looked at these patients, we followed them up for three years, four years. All these patients who have received stool transplant initially. 
we saw that they were not drinking again. Mm. A lot of them are not drinking again. They are not relapsing without the need for psychiatric counseling or psychiatric medications. Very interesting. And what we found out when we looked at the other groups, so there were groups who did not receive stool transplant and they improved with only medications. They when they were drinking more. So somewhere. Yes, we have a gut brain axis. So there are these particular bacteria mm. in the body where it affects certain signaling pathways from the gut to the brain. And such a pathway is known as kinurin pathway. So when you have a kinurin pathway uh, activation or down regulation, it impacts the brain centers where you feel like drinking more. Mm. So when we changed it with good bacteria, that pathway was completely obliterated, modulated in a way that the drinking center was suppressed and lesser people drank after stool transplant. Which means theoretically this can be used for a lot of other things and not just this. Exactly. So now there is a study going on in the US based on our work and all that uh, where they are looking at uh, people with alcohol use disorders and trying to change their microbiota and seeing how much they will stop drinking or reduce their drinking. So this is happening. What is the value of money to you? Oh, okay. Yeah. The value of money. Yeah. I think the value of money for me is uh, the way we earn it and the way it is being spent. Uh, for me, I, I, I practice clinical medicine in the most ethical way that I can, in the most rational way I can, in the most moral way I can, without burdening my patients. And I, I don't mind doing it for a very long time, any time. I'll, I'll choose this career even, even in my next lifetime, if, if there is something like that. Right, so that, that, that is the value of the money that I earned there. And it's, it's righteous and it, it is satisfac satisfying for me. Now the money I earn, how do I, how do I spend it? That lies in the real value. So like I told you before, I, I, I earn enough for my and my family is comfortable. When I see that, you know, there is a bit that I can do more with it, I utilize it for these projects. For example, the public health works and everything I do. And I've been doing that for the last five years. And now it has come a time when my family commitments are going up and my, you know, uh, the, the money uh, value has gone to a different level where I have to take care of my family. So that is why I have brought it down to a level where I'm not spending too much on public health. So the value lies in the way it is earned and the way it is spent. And uh, I, I, I want to believe that I'm, uh, the value is, I mean, I'm doing it the right way and I'm spending it the right way. Got it. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you for having me. Some it was a great conversation. You're not tired, right? No, absolutely not.